Right, welcome everybody. We're going to continue our talk of fallacies today. And uh, where do we leave off? Circular logic. So yeah, circular logic basically is when you assume X to be true and your conclusion proves that X is true. So the argument is, mm, uh, technically it's valid, right? But um, it's, it's, what's the best way of putting it? Usually they disguise it to make it look like it's it's um, accomplishing more than it actually does. Because technically, if you say, <clears throat> you know, if X is true, then X is true. Okay. Okay. No, I, don't. <clears throat> I got no problem with that. But what usually happens is that they disguise it. Like, they'll start with like a hypothetical. Like, maybe if you know, aliens are real, it's kind of a hypothetical, then they'll conclude, therefore aliens must be real. And so that's something called a modal fallacy. A modal fallacy is when you say, because something is possibly true, it's necessarily true. And that's not right. So, um, Nintendo portable Wii emulator. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. Um, yeah, emulation is, is an interesting area to talk about piracy, by the way, because there's a bunch of old games that we would not be able to play anymore if it wasn't for emulation, right? The, the National Archives have actually preserved a lot of historical games using emulation. And in the future, if um, all this DRM stuff becomes too hard to break or too hard to emulate, then a lot of old games are going to be lost. Like, what if you want to play Alpha Protocol? I don't know. The original Age of Empires 2 was basically unplayable. It was one of my favorite games ever. And uh, fortunately, there was a team that sort of kept it going, a volunteer team that kind of kept it going. And uh, Microsoft eventually came around to like, oh, wow, people are still playing this 20-year-old game. Let's make it official and let them officially release, you know, a high-def version of it. And then that did well. And then they came out with a complete remake of Age of Empires 2. But a lot of old games just don't get that remake treatment. Like, there's a lot of very worthy games like Fallout New Vegas that kind of really, really need to be remade. <laughs> uh, Fallout New Vegas, by default, has a 2 gigabyte limit on RAM. And so if you try installing mods and things like that, you run out of RAM, so then you have to patch to be 64 bits, and it's this giant mess. Mario Kart Wii, yeah, there's a lot, in, and emulators are a way that people can play the old games. Sometimes you purchased, right? Like, I've, I've purchased Age of Empires 2, like, I don't know how many times, like seven times or something, you know? Like, I don't know if that's an optimal um, scenario. Something like that, yeah. The original uh, I bought um, on CD... Then I rebought it on Steam. Um, maybe seven times a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, but I think I lost the disc and I had to buy it again. <laughs> I don't know. And then I bought the HD remake, the Definitive Edition remake, the two expansion packs. Yeah, let's call it seven. It's not exactly a repeat buy of seven times, but I've given the money seven times for almost the... Yeah, same product. So. Okay. Does emulation fall under pirating? Yeah, it does. Well, the emulators themselves aren't piracy. You know, you're you're free to make an emulator and um, release it and stuff like that. But any of the uh, scanned copies of Resident Evil or Wii Sports or whatever, that's most definitely a copyright infringement. And uh, yeah, you're you're engaged in piracy, even if the company doesn't sell the the product anymore, even if um, they don't want you to play it anymore, you know, they want you to buy the new one, like for the Madden games, right? Every year they come out with a, a Madden game, and then they turn off, they shut off the servers for the old one, right? Uh, so, like, if you play, like, a FIFA game, you can only do so for, like, a couple years, and then after that they shut the servers down. And a lot of these games, like, if you try, like, seriously, try it. Try playing, like, some um, uh, old... PlayStation 3 games, not even, not even, you know, two generations back, right? The, the PlayStation 3 store is about to get shut down. People protested, so they kept it open a little bit longer. 
Now they've removed the ability to give credit cards on the PlayStation 3 card, uh, the PlayStation 3 store. So it's still up. You just can't buy anything uh, unless you go to, um, you know, Vons or something and get a, a a gift card and load it up. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that, you know, once they've sort of abandoned their interests, like morally speaking, it's kind of a, it's kind of a gray area. It's like, I'm, I mean, does EA have the right to take away a game from you that you purchased? You know, you want to, you want to go play, you know, the last season that your favorite player was, was good. Sorry. Can't do that. You know, and to me, I think there's sort of a moral argument to be made that companies should not have the right to reach into your computer and turn off software that you purchased. They don't have to support it. One thing, you know, but like, um, um, Apple, you know, is famous for patching older iPods and iPhones and things like that to slow down so that people would buy, you know, the new version. GTA five online is closing in December. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I mean, technically it is copyright infringement, right? You do, you do not have the right to distribute a copy of resident evil one. It's under copyright for the next century or some ridiculous amount of time like that. So, okay. So, uh, appeal to consequences. Okay. So this is a great fallacy. Um, usually, usually people don't state the argument in such a way that you will detect that it is an appeal to consequences, but it is a very, very common fallacy. Okay. So for example, People want to be right. Not That's not for example. People want to be right. People don't like feeling stupid. You know what I mean? Like, um, I was talking to uh, a uh, person at a yoga class, and uh, apparently she teaches at the same college I do, and um, she's like, I teach, I teach English. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I was an English minor in college. And, she, and she's like, have you heard of, you know, this book? I'm like, no. And she, I'm like, is it good? She's like, how have you not heard of this book? I'm like, because there's a lot of books out there. <laughs> the world's a big place, you know, <laughs> like, you know, and, and it's like, I, I didn't want to feel dumb, you know, but I, I'm like, just tell me what it is and I'll, I'll, I'll read it. You know, if it, if it sounds cool, you know, like you're, you're an English professor. If you tell me it's a great book, I, I will believe you, you know, just, you know, but she's just like, what school did you go to? I went to Berkeley. I was like, okay, yeah, it's just, <clears throat> UCC. I was a minor. Did I tell you I was, I was an English minor, not a major. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people, people just don't like feeling stupid. Like it, it just makes us feel bad, you know? And, uh, appeal to consequences is the underlying that desire to not feel dumb underlies appeal to consequences. Let's say that you're a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you're sort of invested emotionally in the notion that God's real. And if you're an atheist, if you've broken away from your family and, and caused all this family drama, and you're like, I'm an atheist, dang, and they're like, get out of here. You're invested in like God not being real, right? So let's say that somebody presents an argument that God's real. The Christian's going to be like, oh, yeah, believe it. And the atheist is like, I reject it. You know, and, and that happens usually prior to actually hearing the argument. <laughs> right? Because, because if, you know, God is real, then that makes me happy. You know, and so hearing an argument that makes God real somehow makes me happy. And so I tend to accept it as true. And the atheist would be like, man, if this was right, then I'd have to go back and apologize to my family, you know, and, and that would be just like a whole another set of drama. So I'm just going to reject this before hearing it, before hearing the argument, I'm just going to reject it. And I'm just going to look for any excuse that I can. So that's how the human brain works. The human brain is not a logical brain. This is something that I think you've, you've seen over and over again in this class when doing critical thinking, the human brain doesn't work like a computer. We're not logical beasts by default, you know, we're, we're giant bundles of emotion, 
and critical thinking is about recognizing the fact that we are emotional creatures and trying to, you know, act in a rational way as much as we can. And so appeal to consequences is this. <clears throat> X. Something's true. Second premise. X makes me sad. Conclusion. X is false. Contrawise. X. Premise one. X is true. Premise two. X makes me happy. Conclusion. X is true. Both of those are appeal to consequences. <laughs> um, Marx's theory of truth or reality of the truth is convenient for you. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Marx's theory of truth is appeal to consequences, right? Uh, did the Chernobyl plant melt down? No. Why? Because that would make Marxism look bad. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, they, they really didn't want to admit that they uh, had a runaway, you know, nuclear meltdown at the Chernobyl plant until like clouds of radioactive dust like scattered across, uh, you know, Eastern Europe. Yeah. I'm glad X is true because if X wasn't true, I'd be sad. Yeah, that's a field consequences, and usually they don't express it like that, right? Like, usually people don't just come out and say, if what you're saying is true, I'll be sad. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to believe it. Right? Global warming is a great example of this, right? I drive a truck. If global, tr if global warming was true, I would be a bad person for driving a truck. Therefore, global warming is not true. Okay? So, um... But people usually don't just come out and say it like that. You know what I mean? Like, it's usually like, uh, you know, I, uh, your, 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 uh, your science has not convinced me or, or something like that. So, um, yeah, just because people don't accept the president doesn't make him not the president. I wrote the slide under Trump, still applies to Biden too. Just because you don't like the fact that he's president doesn't make him not the president. But even still, you, you would see people even into the fourth year of Trump's uh, presidency. That they'd have signs marching around saying, not my president. You know, like, he's your president. You just don't like him. There's a difference. <laughs> you know, with Biden, you know, some large percentage of Republicans say he was not a legitimately elected president. Why? Because they wanted Trump to win. You know, there's uh, I've, I've looked at these claims of election fraud haven't seen anything, you know, haven't, you know, that's what I do. Like when people make a claim, I'm like, all right, show me the evidence for it. I look for it. I'm like, mm, yeah, there, you know, sorry. Yeah. Biden won. Stop the steal. Yeah. That was, and that was a big thing like back earlier in the year. Right. So, and that ties in with technology too, right? Cause Facebook shut down the stop the steal group, right? So people were organizing on Facebook and Facebook shut them down. You know, and that was, I think, prior to the the January 6th writing, right? And uh, that whole question of social media is something we'll, we'll get we'll get into more in this in this semester. It's a, it's a really really big topic right now. Like I told you before, I'm reading a book written by some Stanford professors that I think is basically targeted at the kinds of people that work at Facebook. And so once I finish that, we'll 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 get into it. Okay, so here is a, a Saturday morning breakfast cereal. It's one of my favorite web comics. Your your birthday was on January sixth. Oof. <laughs> so this fallacy is saying if X is true and you hate it, um, no, the fallacy is this. Th this is appeal to consequences in a nutshell. People usually, though, they, they'll hide it, you know, because if, if you just say it like this, it'll be, you, you'll, you'll come off as very obviously irrational, you know. Uh, I want to travel through space, you know, therefore I think that aliens are real, right? Like, if you just say it like that, you know, 
then people are like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. There's no logic there. You know what I mean? Like, I want to travel through space. Okay. Therefore, aliens are real. Nope. That's invalid. You know, just because you want something to be true doesn't make it true. I really wish I could have a chocolate bar in my hand right now. Yeah, sorry. I came back from uh, war, my, my camping trip with them. Um, they gave me a giant box of food. We had way too much food at war. It's ridiculous. 20 bucks a day. We had barbecue. We had breakfast burritos yesterday. So much food. And uh, so I, I was like, hey, can I take some graham crackers home for my daughter? And they gave me and they, they gave me an entire shelf of graham crackers and marshmallows and uh, all this kind of stuff. But there's no chocolate because they ate all the chocolate. <laughs> So now I wish I had a chocolate bar in my hand. Yeah. Reality doesn't work that way, you know? Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, they picked out all the chocolate off the s'mores shelf, you know? We had two bag, two giant bags of marshmallows, and Ada was excited for those. She's like, oh, marshmallows. But yeah, reality doesn't work that way. That's why appeal to consequences is a fallacy. Just because you want something to be true doesn't make it true. Just because you wanted Trump to be president doesn't make Biden not president. Just because you wanted Clinton to be president doesn't make Trump not president. Reality is a certain way and you're just engaging in uh, disorderly thinking when you want it to be otherwise. You know? So, some of the chocolate 100 MP. <laughs> if I was a summoner from the Final Fantasy universe, yeah, well, what would you summon? Bahamut, you know, a giant dragon and come down and nuke people? Hell no. I would summon chocolate into my hand. Exactly. Thanos used to work for Hershey's. I probably am, am not following that uh, thread. Okay. <laughs> Reality can be whatever I want. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, if you have the Infinity Stones, I guess it does work that way for you. And he should have summoned chocolate. Like, I mean, honestly. Like, what did he do? He killed half the people in the universe? Dude, bro. Make a giant Statue of Liberty out of milk chocolate. That's all I'm saying. Like, you know, turn, you know, oh, people are starving. There's too many of them. Are you going to kill them out of mercy? Or do you summon a giant Statue of Liberty out of chocolate? I mean, I'm just saying, the choice is clear. So. <clears throat> they have one in Vegas? Oh, really? That's cool. Okay, so. Um... So the pragma this does tie in a little bit with the pragmatic theory of truth. The pragmatic theory of truth is that when the evidence is balanced, then roughly balanced, then you are morally justified in believing what makes you happy. So you might notice that there's a reversal for a lot of these fallacies. All right, appeal to authority, it's a fallacy. Something's not true just because Neil deGrasse Tyson says it's true. That said, if Neil deGrasse Tyson tells me something about space that I didn't know, I'm probably going to believe him, you know, just because he knows more about it than me. So, there can't be starving children if there's no... Ch yeah, I mean, yeah, or you could make giant bridges out of chocolate. I'm just saying, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of less dark... Like, he seems all sad about it, you know. Like, just, like, maybe don't kill the people. I don't know, you know. Take the Half-Life 2 approach, just sterilize half the people on the... I don't know, like, you know, there's this... You know, provide clean food and water to the universe. There's there's options. I'm just saying. Yeah. At the cost of dental health, he could infinity stone people's teeth to be good. Okay, so um, yeah, but that that generally applies. Well, I mean, I, I guess it does apply to empirical as well. Um, you know, if if there's uh, if there's two theories that are equally balanced, one of which is that you don't have free will, one of which is you do have free will. Uh, William James is like, I'm going to believe I have free will because it makes me happy. And it seems to work out pretty well for him. You know? so. uh, did I post Friday's lecture? Yeah, it's on It's on, uh, It's on. on YouTube. Um, okay, so false generalization, or uh, sometimes you'll hear it as hasty generalization. Um, is, there's a lot of different false generalization fallacies where basically you've got um, some group that you're talking about and you're going to draw a conclusion about the group and it's wrong. Okay. 
uh, for example, racism, <laughs> right? So like racism is usually based on either somebody telling you something about a group of people you don't know, or you base it on an encounter with one or two people. And oftentimes when you have a negative interaction with somebody from a group, that negative interactions actually affect us as people much, much more strongly than positive interactions, right? Like when I was in Germany, I had a number of very positive interactions with Germans. Um, uh, we went uh, to a Greek restaurant and uh, one of us forgot our money. And they're like, just sit down, just eat, just go back to your hotel afterwards and get the money. And, and we just talked to them and we're like, hey, tell us about the history of this area. And this, oh, this used to be part of East Berlin. And like, we just had a really positive and they're like, come back. You know, and we came back the next day and they're like, oh, we can see you again. I mean, they're just like super nice, you know, but, but on that same trip, I had a number of negative interactions with Germans and that's what sticks with me. They will steal your seats. If you stand up and go somewhere, a German will sit in your seat. Apparently this is the thing. Like I asked around about it, like, is this a cultural thing? And they're like, yeah, if you're not on your seat, they assume you're not using it and they will sit in it. And so I come back to my table where my food is, like I, it wasn't even cleared and there was somebody sitting in my seat and I'm like, bro, okay. So I just sit down next to them and then just keep eating my food. And they're like looking at me like, why are you sitting next to me? I'm like, why are you sitting in front of my food, dude? Like the food's here. Like I, I went to the bathroom and I came back and you're sitting in my seat, you know? And so I just sat down next to them and just slid my food over and just ate next to them. And they're, they looked at me like, excuse me. You know, and I'm like, it's my food. Sorry. You know, there's no other tables available. Um, and so they just, okay. And then they just went back to talking and we just had a very awkward dinner together. Um, and that happened repeatedly. That happened repeatedly. And I was just like, what the hell is going on here? You know, and um, apparently, you know, and I asked around and apparently it's just, a, it's a cultural thing. You know, and that stuck with me a lot more than the all, all the positive interactions I had. That's just how the human brain works, you know. And um, yeah, it's it's not like you know, like they cleared the table or anything, or there was just a half empty cup. Like literally, I had a full spread of food there, and they sat like I don't, like to to my American mind, I was just like, bro, like <laughs> you not I, you know. I, another time I left my wife's purse in the seat, you know, like I'm here and they moved the purse out of the way and then sat in it, you know? So, um, yeah. And it's just a cultural thing. They just think it's wasteful to have empty seats sitting around. Apparently that's cause I, you know, I'm like, all right, I, I, I need to know if I'm about, cause I'm about to start a diplomatic incident here. So like, you need to tell me, is this like normal behavior or are they just like screwing with me? You know? And they're like, yeah, they just consider it inefficient to have open seats. And so, yeah, I, I had it on that trip. I had a number of very awkward dinners where like I'm on one half of the table. A group of Germans was on the other half of the table and we were just ignoring each other and eating together, you know? So I was like, okay, yeah, that's. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it was East Germany. So, you know, it's our table now. Right? So, so. You know, if I was to if I was to make a generalization about that, you know, like Germans have no respect for you know people's personal space. You know, maybe um, maybe that's not accurate, right? Because this it, it it happened more than once, but it happened four or five times, <laughs> which is a lot more than I would have expected. You know, but do you, you get what I'm saying? Like, so I had these like negative interactions, and then. I'm coming back now and I'm like telling people in America, like, yo, if you go to, if you go to, if you go to Germany, put down a spike strip in your seat, you know, and, and a giant blinking sign with your face on it, you know, and stuff like that. And maybe it's not accurate. Maybe it was just a Berlin thing. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? And so you have to be very careful when you draw these, you know, big conclusions from a small sample set, you know, uh, one, an, another example that happened to me was I went through three Western digital hard drives in, in a month. And if you've ever installed Windows and gone through that process of downloading Steam, you download all your games onto it, and then your hard drive breaks, you're just like ready to just like walk back into the computer store and just like throw the hard drive at them and be like, you know, and it happened three times. And so I was like, I'm never buying Western Digital again. 
because their hard drives are obviously unreliable. You know, false generalization. Hard Western Digital's hard drives. If you look at their, if you look at their um, reliability stats, like a cloud. No, it's not cloud. Back burner. There's some website that publishes stats for hard drives. They have data centers. And uh, you don't want to remember. Yeah, when when hard drives go out, man, that is a that is a rough. That's a rough thing. Yeah, I, I just figured like it's Western Digital, like they're a very repeatable company. And after the third one, I was just like done. I'm like I I will not buy a Western Digital hard drive ever again. And I've pretty much kept that over the past twenty years. I bought a Western Digital hard drive to upgrade my PS4, I think, PS3, PS4, and that was it. And that was only because they didn't have anything else in stock. So, um, yeah, yeah, SSDs are <coughs> affordable. Back back in the day, though, SSDs had reliability too. So, anyway, point is, false generalization is you've got a very small sample set, like three drives breaking. And then you're just like, that company sucks. You know, you drive a Ford, your Ford break down, breaks down all the time. Ford sucks. Do you understand? Like, you can't just go from, like, your car sucking. Because maybe, yeah, maybe they screwed up on your car. You know, like, maybe that, the, the factory was just having a bad day. The union was about to go on strike. They dropped a couple bolts into your engine, you know. <clears throat> it's possible your car sucks. But to go from your car sucking to Ford's suck. You know, that's not, that's a false generalization or it's a hasty generalization. It might not be false. Um, it's a hasty generalization where you make a generalization too quickly before you've done your work. So, um, so how do you avoid false generalization? Because we do generalizations all the time, right? Um, George R. R. Martin is a good author. You know, what are you basing that on? Well, I've read, you know, these books by him, you know. Have you read all of his books? No, but I've read a lot of them. So, you know, I would say it's not a false generalization. You know, but like, if you read, I don't know, one one book by an author who's written 500, then that would be probably a hasty generalization because you don't have enough to go on. You know what I mean? So how do you do it? How do you, how do you avoid false generalization? And there's a lot of fallacies that are in the category of false generalization. Uh, the uh, fallacies of composition and division, the false generalization fallacies, in different ways. We'll talk about cherry picking in a, in a second. How do you avoid them? Because that's the big, that's the big takeaway here. How do you avoid it? Do you do you travel through Germany, stepping away from your seat, setting up binoculars, trying to test how long it takes for, you know, somebody to come in? poach your seat you know how do you do it how do you how do you avoid how do you you know like if if you had you know you don't have enough money to buy thousands of western digital hard drives how do you avoid it right four to five dentists recommend are toothpaste yeah. i will never buy a ford yeah but how do you avoid it like how do you know that fords suck right like let's say that you wanted to provide justification to your statement, Ford makes terrible cars. How would you do it? You can't. You can't just say, "Well, my car broke down," because they make millions of cars. You know, car, some cars are going to break down. It's just, it's just a fact. You know, Nissan is a pretty reliable company, and my transmission went out after thirty thousand miles. Because Nissan CVT suck. <laughs> a survey, yep. Yeah. I got a letter for a class action lawsuit for your model Ford. That's a that's a good one. You know, by the way, we're suing Ford because they're so bad. Um, do the research on the parts and the history on their durability. Sure, yeah, those are all good answers. Those are all good answers, and and all of them basically boil down to doing stats, doing statistics. You guys understand? It doesn't have to be you necessarily. Like you could buy. Have you guys ever seen like Consumer Reports magazine? Um, stats, the funny math, yeah. Stats is stats is really good, by the way. Like everybody needs a, a grounding in. Everybody needs a grounding in stats. It's one of the most important things in life. Have you guys seen websites like this or 
like Kelly Blue Book. And which car brands make the best vehicles? Well, there you go. Look at that. That was the first thing. Uh, reliability. Okay. Oh, I don't want to log in. Oh, I don't want to log in. Okay. Never mind. Uh, whatever. They they basically will, they 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 publish these tables that contain reliability information for different brands and for different types of products and those brands. Yeah. You need stats. You don't. Yeah, you do. <laughs> what a what a what career do you want to go into, Joanna? Like what uh what do you want to do for a living? Art? Yeah, maybe not. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> Uh, mostly though, like people need stats for life. Why? Because this, if you want to know something about the world, stats is how you know things about the world. You can't just take a single event like a pine tree falling over and then conclude from that, well, pine trees are very fragile trees that fall over a lot. You have to do the stats on it. Stats are how you know things. So somebody would have to do a study which they examined the rates at which trees blew over in windstorms and things like that, and then gather data, and then they use stats to go from the data to the conclusion. Okay. Stats is more fun than calc. Yeah, calc isn't really very useful. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in, in computer science, uh, I guess it's good to know calc, I guess. Um, in my professional career, I've used it once. No, I take it back. I take it back. Uh, well, I, I used differentials once at one job. And I used um, partial derivatives at another job. So I, I, I guess it kind of comes up 20% of the time. It comes up 100% of the time. But stats, man. For life, stats. Why? Because that's how you know things. You eat an apple, it tastes bad. Okay, apples taste bad. Does it? I don't know. How do you know? You have to do stats. You try different apples, gather data, and then the conclusion you make comes from stats. And in general, false generalizations come from people not doing stats or not doing them properly. Okay. So, yeah, derivatives. Yeah, derivatives, sure. Okay, so here's the problem, is that the human brain is very good at finding patterns, right? And, uh, and so sometimes, yeah, we can extrapolate from very limited data, and sometimes we're right. You know, uh, in, in fact, in the time in which I was having those issues with Western digital hard drives, Western digital hard drives had a failure rate of 80%. So my brain was like, WD sucks, never buy them again. Correct, at least for that quarter. They they had a bad seal, I think, on their hard drives. And so dust would get in, the, dr the drives would explode very quickly. So... Um, uh, not explode, but uh, it, it's called, um, so the way a hard drive works, you have a spinning platter, it spins really fast, and you've got a magnetic head. If you've ever seen like a vinyl player, the head kind of floats on the air above the uh, spinning platter. There's like these little aircraft wings, and the thing floats on a cushion of air above it, and the thing moves back and forth and reads magnetic data off the hard drive. Uh, if dust gets in there, then the hard, then the hard drive uh, needle burrows into the disc and just... It just wipes it out. So uh, hard drives have to be sealed hermetically with no dust in them whatsoever. And if you allow dust and turn it into a hard drive, it will die. It will just carve a, a carve a chunk out of the uh, out of the thing. Yeah. Okay. So cherry picking is another kind of false generalization fallacy. Yeah, they're very very fragile because they need to run at high speed. And the, and the needle is just a little, little, little bit above the uh, surface of the platter. And so if dust gets in, then it just makes contact and it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, 10,000 RPMs is a very fast rate of speed. You know what I mean? Okay. So cherry picking is another kind of false generalization fallacy. It's when, um, it, oftentimes it's deliberate, okay? So like, um, if somebody says, you know, I met, 
um, I met a Republican and they were racist. Therefore, all Republicans are racist. That would be cherry pick. Yep. I met a Democrat. She wanted to take my gun away. Therefore, all Democrats want to take my gun away. You know, cherry picking. You find examples to make your case. Okay. You uh, what you do is you have a you have a case you want to prove. It goes back to appeal to consequences. A lot of these things are interact. They they connect, right? It's like you got a, You got a thing you want to prove, right? And so, uh, you know, if I want to prove that. Um, uh, if I want to prove that uh, Democrats, the hippiest, most progressive wing of Democrats, can't run the government, then I'd look at Chaz or Chaz or Chap or whatever it was the um, autonomous zone that was Capitol Hill autonomous zone that was set up in Seattle. I'll be like, look, that's what you get if you put a progressive in charge. You know, you get a bunch of people banging on bongos, tearing apart the police station, complete anarchy. You know, cherry picking, right? You cherry pick an example to prove your point. See, there you go. That's what happens when you allow that kind of political alignment to get in power. And then on the flip side, you know, if I wanted to show that Republicans run trustworthy, I'd be like, look, you know, Republicans rarely protest, but when they do, they invade the Capitol, Capitol Hill. You know, and, and uh, they put on bear horns and uh, sit in the Speaker of the House's seat and, um, I don't know, cosplay as, uh, <laughs> right? You know, and so that's what that's why you can't trust a Republican. Because if you, if you trust a Republican, they're going to put a giant bear shaman hat on and go marching around inside of the Capitol Hill. You know, it's cherry picking, right? It's, it, you, you just find, you find an example to make your point. You're like, see, that's why I'm right. Okay. It's a false generalization. I feel like the test is going to be difficult because a lot of these overlap. Yeah, and that's why when I write the quiz questions, I don't... Um, for example, if I were to say that last example there, you can't trust Republicans because if you give Republicans power, they will um, put on bear hats and invade the Capitol Hill. That's appeal to consequences, probably. You know, because... You know, it's just like, look... Emotion, it's appeal to emotion, it's a false generalization. Cherry picking is a form of false generalization, so I'm not going to put all three of those on there. Um, quitter, there it's going to be like cherry picking is one, and then like fallacy of uh, division. No, I wouldn't even probably put fallacy of division on there. Uh, equivocation fallacy, which is when you use the same word in two different meanings. No, I'm not using two words in different meanings, I you know. Uh, or uh, affirming the consequent. No, it's not. It, no, it's not hasn't. No, <laughs> you know, like the, the wrong answers are usually very wrong. Like I don't, because there is overlap between different fallacies. I don't put two similar ones on the same multiple choice for that reason. <laughs> Kids are annoying. Yeah, uh, slaps a kid. See, but like not even that. Like all you have to do to prove that kids are annoying using cherry picking is you just find one super annoying kid, you know? Because there's always going to be a super annoying kid, right? Like, you know, every every class, you know, there's going to be some kid in there that's annoying, you know? Not you guys. You guys are great. But I mean, like, kids, right? And you're like, see, that kid right there? That's why kids are annoying. That See? That one kid is annoying. That proves my point. Kids are annoying. Cherry picking. What you do is you have a whole bunch of kids, and you select the very worst one, Pull them out, be like, that kid sucks. That kid sucks right there. Therefore, all kids suck. Cherry picking. You've, you've got a basket of cherries. You're picking out just the one that'll make your point, And you ignore the rest. Okay. <laughs> that one kid that Fortnite dances and say their generation is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was on a plane flight, and there was a kid that was kicking... The uh, chair of my dad, my dad was sitting next to me. This kid kept kicking his chair and kicking his chair. And finally my dad turns around and goes like, do you mind not kicking my chair, please? And the kid's mom says, he's just a kid. He's just a kid. You can't talk to him that way. He's just a kid. 
I was like, all right. Oh, now I know why the kids will asshole, isn't he? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you're, you're the mom. You're just sitting there watching your kid kick the chair, kick the chair, kick the chair in front. I understand now why he why he operates that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, and so basically, if somebody says uh, something bad about a group that you like, um, you say, "Oh, that's just an isolated example," right? But if somebody says something about a something bad about a group you don't like, you're like, "Look, that example proves proves the rule to be true." So it's a uh, you know that, and, and you will see this all throughout political discourse. Well, what about the what about the buildings that were burned down during the Black Lives Matters movements? Well, those were the results of uh, uh, agent provocateurs that was trying to make Black Lives Matter look bad. You know. Well, what about the uh, the, the Capitol Hill riots? Oh yeah, see that proves my point that Republicans can't be trusted. You know that they those protesters there gathered at the Stop the Steal protest. That represents every Republican in America ever. You know, it, you understand cherry picking. So when it's your group, you're like, oh no, that's cherry picking. You can't do that. And when it's the other group, you're like, yeah, that example proves the entire group is that way. Uh, the kid was like probably, probably six or seven. You know, it wasn't like a baby. You know, so the kid whose legs were long enough. You know, to really dig into the. See it in front of them. Do you guys understand? Cherry picking? We need very little evidence to confirm our beliefs. We need a lot of evidence to change our beliefs. That's kind of where it comes from. <laughs> Anakin, right? So, so you go, cherry picking. Ignoring real patients in favor of those that will give you the results you want. <laughs> That's funny, Joanna. And my dad wasn't yelling at the kid. He's like, do you mind not kicking my chair, please? You know, that was, that was literally the tone of OEC use. He's like, could you, do you mind not kicking my chair? You know, you can't talk to him that way. He's just a kid. He's just a kid. You can't talk to him. Okay. <laughs> so again, in order to escape from the trap of false generalizations, to escape from the trap, of cherry picking, we have to use statistics. That that is that is the the key. That is how we can actually say we know something with a certain amount of confidence. Okay. So when we uh, when we say that um, uh, Americans support interracial marriage and uh, uh, people in South America don't, right? That would be a claim. People in America support interracial marriage. People in South America, or South America, wow. South Africa, South Africa, big difference. South Africa, don't. Um, well, okay, show me show me your evidence. Okay, here's survey data. All right, it's like what some of you are saying. Here's some survey data. In America, something like 95, 97% of Americans support interracial marriage. South Africa, it's like, I think in the 40% range, something like that. Might be higher now. I think it's like 40% support. Now, 60% support, somewhere in the 40 to 60% range, and then a certain percentage is neutral and a certain percentage is opposed that are about split in the remainder. So, yeah, there you go. It's like, you, you want me to support my claim? Here is statistical data. And then the claim is supported, assuming the survey was done properly, which is a big if. All right. All right. So, um... Your argument is false because now I'm sad. Yeah, yeah. But stats, stats don't care about your feelings. You know, it's like if you do a study properly with good methodology, which is a big if, then that's you know that shows you how reality is. You know, so um, I, I know Democrats that think that all Republicans are racist. It's like if all Republicans are racist, ninety-seven percent of Americans wouldn't be for interracial marriage. You know what I mean? Like do the numbers in your head like it, it's impossible for them all to be racist if 97 percent of americans support in you know so um 
you know, it, that's how, um, that's how you can know things. That's how you can make generalizations. Generalizations come about through stats. Okay. So, um, okay, we got a couple minutes left. Um, moving goalposts. So moving goalposts is part of a dialogue. Okay, so what have we talked about so far? We've talked about appeal to consequences, which is basically I, X is false because of X was true and make me sad, right? Uh, false generalization and cherry picking come about when um, we make some broad generalization about a group without supporting it through statistics. That's the best way of thinking about it. Okay, moving goalposts is different from those two. It is when there's a dialogue between two people. You have person one, person two. Person one says all Fords are terrible. Person two says, but the Mustang's a great car. And person one says, sure, uh, all, all Fords except the Mustang are terrible. So what they do is they, adju they adjust their claim. So when counter evidence comes in, they just keep pushing their, their, their goalposts away from it. Here comes data. No, not data. No. Uh, and they run away. Okay. So, um, if you admit if you admit you made a mistake, then it's fine. Like yes, you're absolutely right. Let me amend my claim. Um, that's actually a good sign that when, you're, when you can admit you're wrong. But a lot of people say, well, what I meant was all Fords except the Mustang. Okay. All League of Legends streamers are annoying. Well, what about Typer One? Well, okay, all all you know. So, but uh, you know what I meant. All of them except for Typer One. Um, <laughs> right. I'm right. You're wrong. And if you ever prove somebody wrong, this is so common. It, it's so frustrating in online conversations when like you prove somebody wrong and they just like, yeah, well, you know what I meant. I, you know, I, uh, I meant everything except what you said there, but the rest of my cl claim still stands, you know, so, um, uh, all Democrats are hippie liberals. Well, uh, my neighbor is a World War II veteran who's very much pro-gun rights and, uh, you know, uh, went aboard at D-Day. He's not a hippie liberal. Well, everyone except for him. You know, we play this game all day long introducing people that are not hippies, you know. So the, both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party are very big, right? We only have two major parties in America. There's a quite a wide spectrum of people in both. You know what I mean? So. Okay. Um, I think we need a third. Yeah, good, good. Libertarian Party, you know, the yellow, Team Yellow. Right? The way the voting system is set up in America, it's, un unless they change how voting works in America, it's very, very unlikely for a third party to ever come onto the scene. Because we when, when the... When we have first past the post voting, um, it's you, you have to basically get a majority all at once in one election in order to get elected. And that's yeah, implausible. <laughs> yeah, so um, George Washington warned us about political parties. Yeah, should have done a better job setting up the system. If you didn't want political parties, you should not have had the voting system we have because the voting system we have essentially guarantees we will have exactly two major political parties at any one time. It ha it's the, As a computer scientist, it's blatantly obvious. When you set up a system, people will optimize for the system. Okay? If you um, set up standardized testing and the standardized testing only tests English and math, which is what we've had in America for the past 20 years or so, uh, since No Child Left Behind, George W. Bush. Guess what schools teach now? They teach English and math. They optimize for the test. What happened to history? Not on the test, not going to be taught. You can teach it on Fridays at 2 o'clock, 2 to 3. That's history time. Really, I worked with, I, I've worked in the history field for 12 years. Your history teacher is probably your coach, and history gets pushed to the margins of like whenever you can squeeze it in you know if there's time left over after english and math you can do a little bit of history with your students that's a that's a worldwide thing but it's not even you know i'm not even taking bush to task here it's like 
when you build a system, you have to think how people are going to exploit it, right? And the founding fathers set up a system where um, the system inevitably gives rise to two major parties. So unless the voting system changes, like we're, this is the world we live in, you know, and um, Obamacare, right? Obamacare says if you make over um, 50,000 a year, you don't get any subsidies. But if you get 49,000, I, I don't know what the actual cutoff is, 49,999, you do. And so people will work until they get $49,000 and stop working. You know, if they're, if they're kind of in that ballpark. Or if you have to give benefits at 30 hours a week, people will hire you for 29 hours a week. And people are like, oh, look at these greedy companies. Like, no, you made a stupid system. You know, people always optimize for the system that you make. So make a better system. Don't be stupid. So, yeah, the tax system. Um, tax system, uh, if you want to have... If you want to have a caregiver, when you're an old person, you want to have a caregiver taking care of you at the end of your life, the state will pay for a caregiver if you make under like $28,000 a year or something. And so if you make more than that, you don't get one. And if you make under it, they give you a full-time caregiver. Full-time caregivers are very expensive. So if you make $30,000 a year, it sucks to be you because you can't afford it now. But, it, but you can write off your medical expenses to drop you below the $28,000 limit. And again, I don't remember what the cutoff is. So you have all these old people that will actually buy multiple copies of health insurance to get their income down underneath the line so they can get a full-time caregiver. So there are people that are fully insured three times and they spend all this money on health care they don't need and don't use just in order to drop below some hard line that the state established so they can get a caregiver. Because it's a dumb setup system. And so there's dumb output results. Anyway, no true Scotsman. So no true Scotsman is um, related to moving goalposts. Do you guys understand moving goalposts? It's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, I think all of my students are very smart. Well, what about... <laughs> what name? Everyone's like, oh, damn. Yeah. What about Steve? Yes, Steve. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody accepts Steve. <laughs> Is a, is a stupid, it is a stupid system. It's a very stupid system. And every time anybody ever draws a black, bright line like that, people optimize around it. It's, it, you know, and they always blame the people like, oh, these old people committing fraud to get free health care. Well, no, it's not fraud. If you allow health care to drop your income, they will do it because you set up the system in a stupid ass way. <laughs> right? So, see ya, see ya, Bailey. So, uh, no, no true Scotsman is similar to moving goalposts. Um, you make some generalization. All Scotsmen eat kippers for breakfast. Well, hey, Angus over there is a Scotsman, but he doesn't eat kippers for break breakfast. Well, see, no moving goalposts would say, well, everybody except Angus, right? They would move the goalpost away, so they would change their claim. Moving goalposts is when you change your claim, right? No true Scotsman takes the opposite approach and says Angus isn't a true Scotsman. Because he doesn't eat kippers for breakfast. Okay. So, um, this only works when there's no connection between, you know, eating kippers and being a Scotsman, right? There's no, there's no direct connection between those two things. No true Scotsman does work if, um, you said, for example, um, All Muslims follow the word of Muhammad. Well, look at Steve over there. Steve is a Muslim and he uh, completely ignores the Quran. Well, Steve isn't a true Muslim then. That's actually probably uh, legitimate. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm a Muslim and I eat pepperoni pizza and drink heavily. You know, you, you, you there, there are times where you, this does work. This form of argument does work when there is a direct connection between being a Scotsman and what you eat, which, you know, um, then, then maybe the, the thing is, is legitimate. Okay. But usually most of the time when you say, uh, all X are Y, and then somebody provides a counter example. And then you say, well, that means they're not a true, you know, X that's usually a no true Scotsman fallacy. 
And we'll, we'll stop it there because we're out of time. So again, we went over today, appeal to consequences. Uh, X can't be true because if it was true, it'd make me sad. You know, appeal to consequences. False generalization is when you don't have the stats to support a generalization. Cherry picking being the most common of those. You select cases to make your case. You know, you select the worst kid in the world. See, kids are terrible. Cherry picking. Moving goalpost is when somebody pro provides you a counterexample to your claim, and so you just move your claim away. Aha, see, I can't be wrong. Oh, more evidence. Oh, oh, shoot, run away. You know, moving goalposts is you just keep changing your claim so you can't be wrong. And then, no true Scot Scotsman similar, except when evidence comes in, we say that evidence is wrong. All right. Well, here's an example of somebody who's a Scotsman who doesn't eat kippers. Well, that makes you wrong, because that makes him not a true Scotsman. Highlight of this lecture, kids are annoying. <laughs> I, I, I don't think kids are annoying, by the way. Um, I used to think that when I was a kid. <laughs> when I was a kid, I found kids to be kind of annoying. Um, now that I've had a kid, um, I just realized it was just the kids I was hanging around with <laughs> back then. All right, see so you guys. Pick it up on Wednesday. Well, well, how the tables have turned. <laughs> see you all on Wednesday.